200 years ago, it was pretty late that they got around to discovering EEG. Um, it was discovered during, uh, no, it wasn't recorded from a patient, just sitting patient. It was first discovered um, during a neurosurgery procedure. And it wasn't published till years and years later, which was 1929 by a guy named Hans Berger. And it got over to the United States within two or three years. And they noticed pretty quickly that if you flashed a light uh, at a patient and while they're recording their EEG, you could actually see the signal in the EEG from occipital scalp. So visually evoked potentials came out of EEG. And similar to uh, in, in ERG, retinitis pigmentosa was the disease that the ERGs were first applied to. Visually evoked potentials were first <coughs> applied in neurology to verify optic neuritis and multiple sclerosis. Like ERGs, the equipment to do it was not available commercially that you could buy until the early 60s for visually evoked potentials. I used one of the first in the beginning you had to have an EEG machine, so you had the write out from the EEG, and then after that, so they used the EEG amplifiers, after that it went to an averaging machine to produce the visually evoked potentials. There was no programming it, there was no keyboard, uh, there was nothing, it only did one thing, and it had three buttons, start, stop, and print. <laughs> it, was all, it was all it could do. So this is the south view of a northbound human, and the sites indicated are the International 1020 system that's used in neurology based on measurements of the head, the nasion to the inion, and the ears over the top of the head. All the placements are 10 and 20 percent measurements of that, so it's called the 1020 International Electrode System. You can get a visually evoked potential from anywhere on the back of the head. When I'm talking to patients, I'll put my hand on the back of the head and tell them this is all visual and the middle's the middle. So the middle is the calcarin fissure, which is indicated by the OZ location, which is a 10% measurement up the back of the head from the inion, this, the bump right here. So it's about three centimeters plus in an adult and a couple of centimeters in an infant. I don't measure the heads. I know about three centimeters. <laughs> so, but EEG labs measure the head. The machines all come with measuring tapes. The most common electrode placements used are either the middle or 0102 or all three. Some labs think that they can lateralize pathology by recording from both hemispheres. Not, but they still do it, the majority of them. There is so much variation in the human occipital pole, and once you get off the surface, the poles start to reverse sometimes, and you'll get false lateralization. So it looks like the left electrode is picking up pathology, but its origin is really the right side but still there are labs that put an array all across the back of the head. Imaging, which tells you the lateralization, <laughs> not that. So I routinely only record from OZ, the middle location. Indian. This is an example, I wanna show you, this was recorded <coughs> here by Jeffrey Anderson uh, using a special, um, uh, MRI, functional MRI setup where he stimulated similar to the way we do clinically with a pattern that, re, that reversed at about three per second and looked at what are the hottest areas in a functional MRI with red being the hottest. Look how it jumps around, the hottest area jumps around depending on the slice level where it's only on one side for at one slice, asymmetric most slices, deep below the cortical surface, other locations. So you, you can't depend on what you're getting from the surface. That's the downside of visually evoked potentials. The upside is anything that messes with the pathways after it exits the eye to and including the cortex will affect it. And usually there's no confusion over what you're looking for. Uh, you know the child has meningitis. 
you know there's been trauma to the occipital pole. You know there's a pituitary tumor. And that, so you, it, it, it's not confusing. The visually evoked potential will quantify the delivery of flash or pattern information to the visual cortex. This is another one too complicated. This is a multi vocal visually evoked potential showing how if you do use several electrodes on the back of the head, how you can get evoked potentials from an area of, of scanning. Okay, let's go into it. As I mentioned at the beginning, in fact, most evoked potentials are extracted from EEG, whether it be auditory or visual or somatosensory. Have you ever seen, seen cases where they do spinal cord monitoring, like during rotations? Have they ever exposed you to the cuts to that? Like you, did you in mid school? See that? Well, they nowadays monitor somat somatosensory evoked potentials through most uh, spinal and, and uh, spinal surgeries. If you present a signal, whether it be a flash of light or a clicker in the ear or a peripheral stimulus to the, to the median or tibial nerve, if you present any signal and then grab with a computer a set time period and grab a similar time period and you add them together over a period of not many presentations you get and evoke potentials because the background averages to near zero because it's random. It's the software, the computer program to do this was the second application of computers during World War II, over 70 years ago. It was used to extract radar signals from jamming. So the e random EEG is the jamming, the pattern, the person views, or the flash of light is the signal. I've lived through all of these. This is the generation of these. The visually evoked potential started out using the grass, uh, the most common is the grass brand in the United States of strobe that they use for photic driving to try to induce seizures in EEG recording. And so in the beginning, this grass lamp was used, in fact, yes, here's the grass lamp. And they haven't changed much for the last 60 years. In the beginning, this was used for the stimulus starting in neurology and then in early evoked potential recordings when they first got, you could buy a computer in the early 1960s. And then started adding patterns to that flash, pattern reversal I'll talk about, pattern onset I'll talk about. So after the pattern flash, they started putting patterns on top of the strobe, the same diameter as the strobe. And then in the 1970s, a neurologist at Queen Square in London, the National Institute for Neurology and Stroke in Great Britain, came up with, I, I, I've met him, I've been to his lab I've seen, back in the 70s and saw how he did it, which was interesting. He took, he took two Kodak projectors and put camera shutters in front of them. And he had one slide that looked like this, and then one slide that looked like this. And by changing the camera shutters, he induced this pattern reversal like I'm imitating here. And he back lined them up and back projected them onto a translucent plastic screen. And that was the first the first application of pattern reversal, which is now the worldwide standard. Why is it a standard? It has the less variability for the potential, that, the look of the potential it produces between individuals, whereas a flash has a lot of variation between individuals. <coughs> the normal pattern reversal visually of a potential. If I tested all of you, they would all look like this unless you have some unknown, path, an unknown pathology. You have a negative wave around 70, 75 milliseconds, a big positive around 100 milliseconds, and then a following negative around 145, 150.
this is about the maturation. You have a pretty good visually evoked potential within six months in an infant, even a pattern one, and it improves up to about school age, and by about age six or seven, it doesn't change much till after 55 or 60. It's, very, it's a very stable response. It'll, When the child is first born, instead of it being a peak of around 100, which is the fourth dotted line, the response will be out here. And if you tested a child every six months or so until they got into school, you would see this peak just march in like this. So that by the time they were about seven, it would be around 100 and stay there for the next 50 years or so. This shows the variation. If you take age seven, that's about, there's about 20 people in each of these average age groups. And look at the mean. There's not a significant statistical change till after 55. After, at like up to seven years old, it varies a lot. And after 60, when aging kicks in, you get a lot of variance. Have a scattergram of that. So, once you get into mid-teens, things tighten up pretty well until you get past 55 up to 60. So this is variation in aging, and prior to that is variation in maturation. The difference between a child that rides a bicycle at four or five versus one that can't ride a bicycle until they're seven or eight, a child that walks at eight months versus a child that walks at 14 months. So you get the greatest variation in the first five, six years, and then again, the greater, even a greater variation in aging after 60 or so. Pattern onset offset is gray screen, pattern pops out, goes back to gray screen. Any patient that has nystagmus for any reason at all, the pattern reversal exacerbates their nystagmus. So you can't use it. You'll get no visually evoked potential. Uh, Degree had a patient a couple of years ago that was sent from California with a diagnosis of optic nerve disease based on their visually evoked potential. They had only used pattern reversal. So they were guaranteed this patient had nystagmus, they got a no VEP. So they said, oh, well, they must have bad optic nerves. But you just needed to new, use a different stimulus. Unfortunately, most labs don't think this through. The technicians hook every patient up the same way. And if you're lucky, they even pay attention if they're watching. I've been in labs where once the, the tech pushes go, they start texting their boyfriend. And then they look up every once in a while, oh, the screen stopped. Oh. They don't even know if they're looking at the, at the monitor or anything like that. And they do the same thing every patient, regardless of they have nystagmus, they don't have nystagmus, their vision is 2400 versus their vision is 2020. You've got to think those things through and apply the different stimuli to fit, fit the patient. <laughs> the pattern onset is also best for poor fixation, eye movement, lingering, deliberate defocusing, and nystagmus. Adults really can't <coughs> deliberately defocus. Uh, children have plastic eyes, they can deliberately defocus, but adults usually can't, but they can not cooperate. <laughs> when, when I have a suspicious patient that's, that's uh, you know, an empty cardboard box, hit them on the head about the size of a shoe box, and they're, they're, they're looking, they, are, they see early retirement, <laughs> and they come into the room like this and stuff like that, and then later you see them texting. And it, uh, they, and I've had patients look at they'll if they're path you know they'll look at the corner of the TV instead of at the center of the TV and stuff like that. This is upside down for the normal presentation, but it shows those age groups uh, of how the time slows with age a little bit. You can estimate acuity with visually evoked potentials, but you guys can do a better job. It looked like years ago, a friend of mine uh, named Sam Sokol uh, invented back, well, 70s really, 
uh, that he presented pattern soup within cartoons and just little babes in arms like this they they look at it and and because the cartoon is random they get visually evoked potentials from him and you can estimate acuity by changing the check sizes within the pattern as you know everyone floats through you do these under anesthesia um, all you have to do is work with the anesthesiologists and tell them to get them as I tell them to make them as light as they're comfortable and and my lines are that and anything short of sitting <coughs> up works for me you cannot get a good evoke, visually evoked potential if you know, under surgical depth anesthesia because you get a flat you get a flat line DEG I use these goggles. We're going to be switching to a little handheld thing that they took to the, on the Micronesia trip. Um, when they come back, that we can produce any colors uh, with these goggles. Just have red LEDs inside. As I mentioned at the first, the classic initial application was through neurology was to to uh, confirm and look at, look at the progression of optic neuritis in multiple sclerosis patients. What happens is, what is the purpose of myelin on the neuron? Speed, speed. So if you get plaques on the myelin on the optic, neur optic nerve neurons, you're gonna get slowing. The classic patient, there are no absolutes in the universe, the classic patients, which would just be one out of 100 or 200, 200, would be one nerve is still completely normal, the top one in this case, the right, and the left is slowed, usually not this dramatically. The classic, not sure they're MS patient, the slowing is usually only 10, 12, 15 milliseconds at the most. So one eye will be right around 100 in a peak time in thousands of a second. The eye with the episodes of optic neuritis will be 110 or 12 or 14 or something like that. <clears throat> but sometimes both are affected at the same time. No absolutes. Over time, when enough myelin is lost in one of the optic, one optic nerve pathways, you'll also start to lose amplitude. And if you would follow a patient from that first 110 milliseconds or so and test them every year or so for the next 20 years, you would just watch it march out like 115, 120, 125, 130, 140, 150, and then when they're like real debilitated and they're in a wheelchair, it's 106, it keeps going, and then after the first decade or so, the amplitude starts coming down too as more and more of the optic neurons in the, in the nerve are affected. So it's a way to quantify the degree also, it, the effect will be more dramatic during, if you catch them during an episode, that when they're, they say they can't see anything, it's like looking through a veil. Another optic neuritis patient, both, both nerves affected, but the left barely, 112, the other 120. just running through different looking, every individual. A patient, is there a reason we see so many neurofibromatosis type one here? Is there any? We, I see a lot. I mean, like almost like MS patients. The best way to quantify neurofibromatosis effects on the optic nerve, unlike what the MRI people think, is not the MRI. The MRI sure will show you the size, but it tells you almost nothing about the degree of function and the effect on the optic nerve pathway. <clears throat> if you look at a neurofibromatosis patient visually evoked potential, you can't tell it from a multiple sclerosis optic neuritis patient. They, they look similar. The initial issue is slowing. I can't, I'm sure there's one, but I've tested hundreds through the years, and they all, even if they don't develop the gliomas, have slowing of the optic nerve pathways by about, by about school age. 
So this is a sad case. This is an initial VEP of an NF1. This is three years later. These are gliomas growing on the optic nerve pathways. This is four years, old, four years later. This is the worst, the worst case scenarios, although the very worst case scenarios is they'll lose an eye because they'll have malignant gliomas. I'm gonna run through some different kinds of patients to, to give you examples of the application of visually evoked potentials. Cerebral palsy with pale nerves. An orbital mass. Sometimes, let's see, I think I have a follow-up on this here. Oh yeah. Sometimes you can get no, the top, the right, with, you'll get no visually evoked potential with a large mass before it's removed, or sometimes in trauma cases, you'll get no visually evoked potential. This is after decompression. It starts to come back a little, look at the top. Again, look at the, just no visually evoked potential, the right eye, those two traces at the top. Start to come back, oh, do I have a further? No, neuro, neuroblastoma. Pale <clears throat> optic nerve. Ambutal nerve toxicity. Also, it looks it looks just like MS. Here's the slowing. Once you get it past about 110, 112, that's two standard deviations. Slowing the strike doesn't go out far enough, but. Anything halfway past, past halfway between the fourth and fifth dotted line is this middle here is 112. That's two standard deviations. I'm not going to go into that. Accardi syndrome, we occasionally see these in exams under anesthesia. Usually it's one eye only with the nerve affected. <coughs> Focal VE visually evoked potentials, similar to multifocal electroretinograms, give you more potentials that you can be more discriminating in detecting the degree of pathology. Our system is roughly similar to this one, except in and the patients, most patients view them like this for other manufacturers. Ours is inside. It uses a different kind of stimulus than the multifocal electroretinogram. This uses a dartboard stimulus like so. This was also invented by Eric Sutter, the guy that invented multifocal electroretinograms. And everybody copied his copied his stimulus like they copied this uh, multifocal ERG stimulus. So normal visually evoked, visually evoked multifocal visually evoked potentials from each eye superimposed. Starting out with an episode of severe acute optic neuritis in the right multifocal During severe, you off, during the episode, you often lose a lot of amplitude so that they can't tell very well, but the lower, the lower line is the right that's red. And then, let's see how much later, two months later, it recovers the amplitude, but the slowing, the slowing almost always is maintained once a person has a significant episode episode of uh, optic neuritis. And then three months after recovery, 
some of the times even recover in part of the field, the lower field. You can see them match up pretty well on the lower field. Ischemic optic neuropathy. Let's go back again to that. Highlights the area affected where you can see the difference between the two hemis two eyes. See the rest of them are superimposed pretty well in this the ischemic attack, it maps within the optic nerve, affected air, affected nerve pathways. Optic nerve glioma. <coughs> so what I'd like you to get out of this is that you can use it to quantify anything that has to do with the optic nerve pathways, whether it be something like birth anoxia, near death, surviving near death, drowning, um, pituitary tumors. I test patients pre and post pituitary tumor removal. Anything that messes with it, and again, uh, there's even more information on the revision site. I get back to there we go find Not dark adaptation to your right yeah there's up top top right for you to start here or over I guess maybe left. it's your left top left top left oh top left this one nope, right, keep, keep going, going. So this is from keep current going. slide the play button one more oh, play button yeah, yeah, yeah right. okay. Traditionally, for the previous 60 years or so, a German piece of apparatus called a Goldman Weaker's dark adaptometer was used for determining dark adaptation. There's the Creel monster in a Goldman Weaker's dark adaptometer. Very German. Very solid. <laughs> Very German, very solid. It uh, it had it, it was just indestructible. It was a great thing. It had a built-in way to calibrate it. It had a rotating disc. It reminds me of the the tracking of walk-in coolers that measures the temperature. Uh, it it had only electronic parts. Was was that disc rotating based on time and. Um, and the light. Other than that, it didn't have anything else that could fail. What the patient viewed inside was a stripe and a fixation point. Your best night vision is about 10 degrees off of center, which would be uh, your fist at arm's length if you looked at the middle of the hand out. Is your best. So you ask the patient to focus, <coughs> look at the little, L, the little red light, which wasn't an LED because the machine was old, it was just a little red light. And then you would turn off the white in the stripes to zero and slowly turn it up and it blinked about once per second. And when they can first, when they can first see the stripe and then you pulled a little trigger and it punched a hole in that, rota in that rotating drum, it's really neat. And the thing the Germans would come up with. Um, 
and you, you could control rotating the stripe so, so that uh, you would ask them which way the stripe orientation because bad patients will guess. You get two, there's two different because of having rods and cones, when you dark adapt a person over time, you will get a cone response or a pathological response. This is congenital stationary night blindness with myopia up there. And the normal person will dark adapt about three logs a thousand fold because rods are three logs more sensitive than cones depending on the color. Three or more logs more sensitive. So this is what you got out of that machine. This rotating drum would, on time, and you'd punch holes in it, and then in the end, you'd put it on a, on a uh, X-ray light box and connect and connect the dots with a pen. <coughs> the concept of rods versus cones and separating the two is similar as in electroretinograms. The peak for rods combined is about 505 to 510 nanometer bluish green, and all the cones combined is about a 560 nanometer, 555, 560 nanometer yellow, tennis ball yellow. So you can do the same kind of dark adaptation using blue dots and red dots. produce two different this phenomena of the little bit of a break here about seven minutes out is called I don't know why it's called the cone break I'd call it the rod break but it's when the rods really kick in they call it the cone break I guess it means breaking away from the cones I don't know who named it you, so you can test people separately like this, and this is the way it's done now with LEDs in Gonsfelds. <clears throat> so now they're done in a Gonsfeld that can produce any color. The patient has a button to push like they're doing a Humphrey visual field and asks to push the button if they see any flash. And the program alternates a red or a blue really dim flash and the program knows if the patient doesn't push it to make it a little bit brighter. If they do push it, make it a little bit dimmer so that over a period of 30 minutes or an hour, depending on how long you want to ch test their dark adaptation, it produces two curves. So the red light curve gives you this for the cones. The blue light gives you this curve for the rods. As you can see, most people are about 90, 95% there within 20 minutes just there 15 20 minutes and there's very little improvement after that if you put a person in really complete darkness and not the approximation we have in in the rooms here where we try to make it completely dark people will improve actually for about 45 minutes if your measurements are sensitive enough and there are labs in the world that test for 45 minutes or an hour I did a study we did a study here once that they wanted an hour I mean just tedious the poor patients to pay attention and push this button for an hour. This is a, pa a patient of Bernstein's that had little small intestine and uh, prior to, to a vitamin A therapy they had no dark adaptation. Just stayed up there all the way across and then this is after uh, vitamin A therapy for two months and then four months got down into not the best possible normal range, but into normal range. <coughs> oh. if, that's Dale. Dale and I have been friends for you know, 40 years. Dale. Dale's now a woman in San Francisco. <laughs> um, Dale's a type, the classic type one kind of uh, albino. He's a, sax, he's a sax player in San Francisco. Uh, 
and I have permission to use this photo. It's, in fact, it's pinned on my office. I have it that I can use this photo for anything. Um, <laughs> albino's eyes get a lot more light into them. So he told me, a, he, he from here, told me a story of hiking at dusk up Mill Creek Canyon. So when they, by the time they got up wherever they're going, it was completely dark. And there's very little light up there because you're pretty far away from the city lights. And he and his friend said, let's race back to the car. Well, his night vision is so much better because his, his eyes let more light in that to him it was just like dusk still. And he could run back and, you know, and the other guys were running into tree lamps. And, you know, he showed up at the car and about 10 minutes later the first guy showed up and he had you know, like cuts on his face and stuff <laughs> like that from falling off the trail and running, running into things. So I don't know if I have it here, but then we, they gave me an idea of doing a study. So I studied, studied their dark adaptation and they are better. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, even because you test people, normal people, you test them dilated, but they still have some pig, you know, they have pigment in their eyes, but let's see, do I have? Yeah. These are, uh, <coughs> high neg albinos, type pod. These are two different kinds of albinos, those that have some pigment, those that, that don't have any pigment. And almost all of them were at the very best of a normal person you'd ever test, or a half a log, or a log, or a log bed. That should be it. It is it. What time is it? Eight, uh, 7 41. Oh, okay. Contrast sensitivity is another way to measure optic nerve function. There are particular channels of uh, neurons that are sensitive to contrast sensitivity. What is contrast sensitivity? This, these are the guy who invented contrast sensitivity as a as a perceptual test, and was the one of the early pioneers <coughs> of visually evoked potentials based on contrast sensitivity was a guy named David Martin Regan. And this was the original Regan charts. So you would test a patient on this chart for their acuity, like you were t testing for acuity normally, and then you would test them on this chart. How well do they do? How many lines and do they get on this chart? And then, take my word for it, it's not very good in here. If we had a darkened room, the this is another level of contrast sen sensitivity. And there's another one, but it's too light in here. And then this was the scoring chart, and everybody does poorer on each, su each successive contrast sensitivity chart. The question is, how much poorer do you do? So the scoring was, most of you would score that you could could read 10 up at the 10 20 20 20 15 line and then at nine percent you might drop a little bit if but if you drop greater than the dotted line that's pathological it agrees almost completely with degree of optic neuritis for example the the results of this fit with the visually evoked potential <coughs> uh, results you get with slowing of the optic nerve and I think there are some, there, I know there are some studies, they have a, a different system on the fourth floor that in that study room on that, in the clinic or pla off of plastics there, there's some study that's using them, using a different version than the, than the Regan, the Regan study. So, so what you get in pathology 
would be the person would drop, here's a person that dropped that dramatically, the dark lines when you, when you get, and sometimes they can only do the first one. They, when you go to the really dim ones, they don't get anything at all. That's what contrast sensitivity is. The end is near. You're going to live. It's going to be close. <sighs> As you're all aware, there are three kinds of color receptors plus rods. A really good source, you want to pursue this further, if you, any reason you have to, is uh, also web vision. Some, uh, a guy has a, like a 40 page chapter on color vision in there. Oh, I love the mantis shrimp. Uh, they have, I forget how many, do, do I have it here? 16 types of color receptors, including UV and polarized light. Do you know the mantis shrimp? The mantis shrimp that, that has the uh, acceleration of a 22 caliber bullet for uh, for killing prey. 22 caliber bullet. Colorful little devils. You know, one of one of his little clubs here. You just you go up and just and then. <laughs> You have to use super high uh, film to catch it. I'll give you an example of where, where we are, that here's creatures that have uh, this extent. And they're not number one. There's, there are animals that have even more receptors and UV and, and infrared and polarized light receptors. These are the th three, three kinds of receptors and they're approximate peak colors in approximate, real approximate colors that I picked. If you combine, if you combine them all together, you end up with t tennis ball yellow. Here's some more, more realistic colors that we work with. So we have, we have the cones in the eye that are receptors, and then sent on to the lateral geniculate, there are plus minus cells that fire that are red green versus, versus uh, and yellow blue cells that's processing so that it's cleaned up a lot before it gets to the visual cortex. And again, this same, if you lump them all together, <coughs> you do this. And they have the, the various, the uh, the various sorting that you see in neuro for detecting color, color problems. I think that might even be it. And then you have the sensitivity difference between all of your cones as a group versus rods, and there's it's at least three logs difference in their sensitivity. Ishihara plates. Test for red green color blindness. Sample. <coughs> it's misspelled. Farnsworth. There's two versions there's a 15 and a 100, which isn't really a 100, I think it's 88, like a piano, key. <laughs> piano keys. It's called the 100. I don't know why it's called the 100. It looks like this. So the patient is give, given them mixed up and there to put them in sequence of color, like a rainbow. HRR plates. 
again, picking things out of dots, triangles, squares, paths. And those are the most common ones used in ophthalmology. You lose, you win. See you next week.